body of Christ. That's who we are. We're not just a church that just exists, but we are the body of Christ. Each and every one of us, we make part of the body of Christ. Yeah? Can I get an amen? Amen. amen. That's who we are. So, as you know, next week we're going to celebrate 35 years. You saw the video, and wow, 35 years standing as a church. That's only because of God. Because we know that if God is not in the mix, what's going to happen? It's going to fall, it's going to fail, and it's not going to stand up. But God has us here for 35 years. We had our struggles, we had different challenges, but God proved himself time and time again, and that's why we're here, 35 years. So, what time next week? We celebrate our 35th anniversary. 4 p.m. where? What day? 27th? Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> That's making sure that we know. So please continue to invite your friends, bring them out. We're going to celebrate. I mean, I don't want to share too much, but the worship is going to be amazing. Right? So, looking forward to that. Um, also, our, our leaders, Nino and Merlin, you don't see them here today. That's because they are the Caribbean leaders meeting in St. Kitts. received God's promised Holy Spirit. Right? So we're going to read in Acts 2 today. But before we get into things, just join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, Almighty God, I thank you for this day. Each and every person is here today because, Lord, you give them life, health, and strength. Father God, as we go into your scriptures, go into your word, take away every distraction, every thought of, of, of that's just distracting God. I pray, God, our hearts and our minds are in the moment here right now. That, Lord, your spirit fills this place. And, Father God, you're able to cut our hearts through your message, through your scriptures, Lord. Open wide the hearts of each and every man and woman, boy and girl here today, so that you could come in, Lord, and work wonders. I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so Acts 2. Let's go. It says in verse 1, When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. And began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they, were, when they heard the sound, sorry, a crowd came together in bewilderment. Because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Christians and Arabs. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they have had too much wine. <laughs> and then the first thing I want to talk about is the fact that if you profess Christ, or you profess to be a Christian, be prepared to be called crazy. Right? Be prepared to be the outcast and people look down on you and say, hmm, you're kind of crazy, you know. You need help. I've been there. I've been there. 
you know, on campus, I would share my faith. And let's just say sometimes there are people that could be a little hostile to the gospel, right? And sometimes in my mind, in my human mind, I could think, ah, do I really want to do this? Boy, I feel like nobody will listen to me. But God always reminds me that there are hearts that are searching for God. And so it's okay for me to look crazy. Right? I remember when I was in secondary school, um, when I, was, I became a disciple at 14, I remember just really being, having the zeal for God. I always talk about the fact that God's Spirit led me to share my faith on a bus. That's something I knew I couldn't do on my own. And uh, let's just say I faced my own persecution there as well. Right? I was viewed as the Jesus boy. Right? But that's okay. That's okay to be viewed as a Jesus boy or the Jesus girl. Why? Because Christ, Christ is really the one that is able to set you free. Nothing else. Not people's opinions, not their thoughts, but Christ is the one that is able to set you free. I mean, think about it, right? People think we're crazy because why? We believe in the resurrection of the dead. We believe that our Lord will come again one day and take his people to be in paradise with him. We believe that Jesus fed the 5,000 with five loaves and two fish. Five loaves and two fish. That's crazy. People would say, wow, those are fables, those are stories. You're crazy for believing that. You're stupid for believing that. You're foolish. But that's where the Holy Spirit comes in. You see, if we don't have the Spirit, these things won't make sense to us. To the outside world, because they don't have the Spirit of God, they see these things, and the only thing they could think is that we're crazy. But that's okay. I'm very willing to be viewed as crazy for Christ. You see, the Holy Spirit is more than just a spirit that allows people to speak in tongues. It's more than just a spirit that allows you to feel a certain way or shake and cry in tears. It's more than that. The Holy Spirit is God himself living in those who have made Jesus Lord of their lives. Now take a second to think about that, right? God himself, who created all things, who has the world spinning on its axis right now, if it wasn't spinning in that direction or at that speed, everything would fly off and just be destroyed. That same God is living in those who have chosen to make Jesus Lord of their lives. That's the God that we serve. A powerful God, not a weak God. Not a small God, but a big God that's able to do above and beyond what we could ever think or imagine. That's the God that we serve. You know what that means? It's me how the Spirit of God can, can take a man like Peter who denied Christ three times and transform him into a man willing to die for the sake of the gospel. If you know the story of Peter, Peter denied Christ three times. He was like, I don't know that man. When they came and asked him, if you know Jesus, I don't know that man. But later down in Acts 2, we will read that Peter boldly proclaimed the gospel of Jesus. So he moved from this timid man to boldly proclaiming the gospel of Jesus. And that's only possible through the Spirit. You don't go from here to here without the Spirit. It's a process. And Peter had to go through that process. You know, when I, when I look at the disciples filled with the Holy Spirit and how they were willing to die for the six they were bruised, they were crucified, some were crucified upside down. Why? Because of the sake of Christ. So I just want to go through just some of the ways of of how the disciples would have died during their lifetime. Simon Peter, what happened to Simon Peter? Simon Peter was crucified upside down at his own request. This was because Peter felt unworthy to die in the same manner as Jesus. 
Andrew. Andrew was martyred by crucifixion, crucifixion again in the Greek city of Patras. Similar to his brother Peter, Andrew felt unworthy to die in the same manner as Jesus. Therefore, he was tied to a cross, but unlike the traditional Roman cross, it was arranged in the shape of an X rather than a T. The unique method of crucifixion reflected Andrew's humility and his desire to distinguish his own death from that of the Savior. And when I think about this, just um, this week I was in a Bible study and I was sharing the fact that these were ordinary fishermen, right? And we always do the scripture in the Bible studies that talks about at once the disciples went to follow Jesus. Immediately they went to follow Jesus. Now this was their livelihood, eh? This was how they made money, how they took care of their family. But from the time Jesus came and asked them, come, follow me, or told them rather, come, follow me, they went at once. To some, that's crazy. Again, people could view us as crazy. Or you could leave your job. Or you could leave your work to follow this man, this rabbi. James, son of Zebedee, According to Acts 12, 1-2, King Herod arrested members of the early church intending to persecute them. James, one of the apostles, was executed by the sword at Herod's command. Herod's motive for this action appears to have been to appease the Jewish leaders who held strong disdain for the growing Christian movement and likely saw the killing as a means to suppress Christ. Historians and biblical scholars generally agree that James met his death in Jerusalem around 44 AD, reflecting the intense hostility that the early church faced, both from Jewish and Roman authorities during that time. I want to give one more. John, brother of James, son of Zebedee, says here that, Fox's Book of Martyrs, a historical account that chronicles the persecution of early Christians, asserts that in India, Bartholomew faced a har harrowing end. According to the text, Bartholomew was subjected to brutal mistreatment at the hands of the local idolaters. Their impatience and hostility led them to beat him severely and ultimately crucify him again. This is the third time we see in crucifixion here. This account emphasizes the fierce opposition early missionaries encountered when spreading the teachings of Christianity. Such persecution was not only physical, but also ideological, as idolaters viewed the spread of Christian doctrine as a direct threat to their own religious practices and beliefs. You know, there's going to come a time where we're going to face persecution similar to this we don't face it now in this side of the world but there is going to come a time that we will and we all have to make that choice whether we're going to stand for Jesus or stand with the world none of us could escape that so are you going to be the crazy old liar and stand up for Christ? Or are you going to go in the world and say, well, this is easy. This is comfortable. We all have that choice to make. You know, with God's spirit inside of you, prepare for persecution. Prepare to be looked at as the wear Jesus boy, or the wear Jesus girl. I love that Acts 1, the, the scripture preceding Acts 2 here, it says that Jesus tells his disciples, but you will receive power, power, when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. The power that we have because of the Holy Spirit. That's what we have to remember. Sometimes we could be limit ourselves and think, well, boy, I can't overcome um, this sin because 
it's too hard, it's too difficult. No, the spirit that we have inside of us that we got at the waters of baptism when we chose to repent and be baptized is a spirit of power. So what the world can't do because they don't have the spirit, we have the power to do it because of God's Holy Spirit. You know, the power of the Holy Spirit will give you the words to speak as you share the gospel with someone in your life, whether it's family members or friends, he will give you the words. I can't tell you how many times I had nothing on my mind, but the Spirit of God allowed me to just speak, and sometimes that just ministered to that person at that point in time. The power of the Holy Spirit will take you through your season of depression, of anxiety, of hurt, and anger, all these different emotions that we could feel, the power of the Holy Spirit can and will take you through these seasons and will demonstrate how good our God is. Amen? You know, if you haven't received God's Spirit today, or maybe you're unsure if you do have His Spirit inside of you, I urge you today to do as the Scriptures say, Repent of your sins and be baptized, every one of you. Why? For the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's clear. It's clear. Repent and be baptized. You know, as we celebrate 35 years as a church, I want to remind us that it's because of God and His Spirit that we're still standing today. Only because of God. We're not perfect. We make a lot of mistakes. We might hurt one another. And the list goes on. But God is holding us together. And he's molding us, shaping us, so that we could mature and be unified as the body of Christ. That's why I shared in the beginning, we are the body of Christ. And we're also human beings and we, we hurt each other, we say things that we're not supposed to say. But if God is the head, then we have unity. Verse 14 to 25. Acts 2, verse 14 to 25. It says, Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd, Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. <laughs> it's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below. Blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. Verse 21, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did among you through him. As you yourselves know, this man was handed over to you by God's deliberate and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by kneeling him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death. Because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Now I want to realize really the fact that this is the same Peter that denied Christ three times. And here he is speaking boldly. All the disciples scattered and left Jesus when he was at his lowest point about to be crucified and suffer. 
But here they are now filled with the Holy Spirit, being transformed to the point that Peter could stand up now after denying Christ and boldly speak in the way he does. You know, Peter goes on to reference the prophet Joel's prophecy being fulfilled at Pentecost, that God would pour out his spirit on all people. Sons and daughters will prophesy. Young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Any old men in the house? We have no old men in the house, boy. What's old boy? Let me see. Old is like, what, 40 and up? Nah, that's young still. <laughs> oh, I push a few buttons there, boy. Sorry. <laughs> All right, so no old men in the house. <laughs> Maybe when I reach 40, I will, um, I will still say I'm young, but okay. Right now, at the age of 22, is, is kind of old for me. I'll, I'll be real. All right? <laughs> right. You know, I don't know about you, but this excites me. The Spirit being poured out on every young man, every young woman, every old man, old woman. I'm excited about this. You know, I mean, Peter saw it in his time, the Spirit being poured out. And we see today how God's Spirit has moved all over the world. The fact that we have uh, several communities or churches throughout the entire world is because of God's Spirit. The fact that you could go to wherever in the world where there is a church and you could spend um, time with the disciples there, stay in their homes, that's something that is really, really because of God. I find joy in community. I find joy in the fact that God could work in his spirit, not just in Trinidad and Tobago, but throughout the entire world, that we could connect with our brothers and sisters internationally. This should give you joy. Verse 20 says, The coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. That's something to look forward to. I mean, what was the purpose of all this? One day we want to be with God. We want to be in heaven. Streets of gold, mansions, singing with the angels. Right? In heaven, I'm pretty sure there won't be people that, that can't sing. God will bless everybody with a nice voice so that we, would, we don't sound off-key. Right? Because sometimes we could sound off-key. Myself included, right? I'm looking forward to that because I love music. And that's something that we all should be looking forward to. This world and its troubles will pass away, but God is eternal. You know, in heaven, there is no more pain, no more sorrow, no more death. I don't know about you, but that's something that that's, I look forward to. Whether I don't have to sit down in my pain or anxiety that I'm feeling currently, but I know that I'm with God for eternity. That's what we should have in mind as we celebrate 35 years as a church. Now one day, we're going to be with God. Don't get caught up and tied up in the day-to-day -day and who say this or who have that or you don't have that. No. No. <laughs> Don't get caught up because there's something else to come that is bigger and greater than right now. One day all of life's tribulations and problems will be no more. There will be no more tears, no more pain, no more sorrow, no more death, just God and his people. Verse 21 it says, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. You know, I urge you, maybe you've been running from God for some time. He's been trying to reach out to you, but you have different things in your life, whether it's sin or whatever you're dealing with right now. Call out to God. You've tried everything else. You've tried the pleasures of this world. You've tried chasing money. You've tried looking good in the front of the eyes of others. And what happened? 
it all failed. But when you call on the name of the Lord, you will be saved. Don't underestimate the power of God's Holy Spirit. Amen? So let's call on the name of the Lord. Verse 26 to 41. It says, Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest in hope because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead. You will not let your Holy One see the key. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Fellow Israelites, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his, did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven and yet he said, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Verse 36, then therefore let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were caught to the heart and said to Peter and the apostles brothers what shall we do Peter replied repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off for all whom the Lord our God with call, will call sorry Verse 40, with many other words he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. You know, the gospel of Jesus still saves till this day. The gospel of Jesus still cuts people to the heart as much as we think that nobody is going to listen to us or people may already know the gospel or know some form of the gospel. God is still able to show people the true gospel, his true word and still save people to this day. It's not something of the past. Peter says here that this message is for all of you and for all your children and for all who are far off. So there are people that are coming after us after uh, maybe in a few years or maybe after a lifetime and God is still able to save them through his grace. You know, I love the picture that is painted here. It says that about 3,000 were added to their number that day. If you think about it, 3,000 people I, I, was, I was at an international campus ministry conference earlier this year and I had the privilege to do some, do some worship. It was in North Carolina and there were 12, I believe it was, no, 1,700 people there. I had 1,700 disciples that came to the conference. And let me just tell you the energy that when I was on stage, the energy that you feel from 1,700 people it's crazy. And so when I look at this and I see 3,000 people, that's exciting, boy. That's inspiring. And that's only because of God. God is the one that saves people. Not us. He uses us as vessels. He uses us to study the Bible with people. But God is the one that saves people. Sometimes I have the temptation of questioning myself as if people still believe in the gospel or if I could even make an impact, especially on the campus that I'm on. 
Sometimes I can become so numbers oriented and think, you know, our ministry is small. Um, I've been sharing my faith for a while. Why is nobody getting baptized? All these different thoughts I could have. And I could feel like, hmm, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe I should stop. But every time God convinces me otherwise. Just this week we had Bible talk. Last week, sorry. And... Uh, there's been a consistent number of people that have been coming out and hearing the gospel of God. You know, it's not always the easiest leading a ministry, but God is able to sustain me. It's not always the easiest, especially with, with um, law school and all these different things that I'm doing with um, performances. But God is the one that sustains me and shows me time and time again that he's able to save people, that people are still listening still waiting for their savior. Today you might be asking, if you're not saved, are the people in the crowd, what do we do? What do I do? What do I do from here? I came today on a Sunday, I'm hearing somebody preach before me, what next? Again, I say it again to reiterate it, to make it clear. As Peter said, repent, repent, and be baptized, every one of you. If you don't know what repentance is, and let me be careful when I say this because sometimes I say the wrong angle. Um, it's a 180, not 360, because 360 means you're going around to come back to the same place. It's a 180, so you're here, you're going in this direction, the path of sin, the path of death and destruction, and 180, meaning you're going there. Now, a different way, that's repentance. It's uh, also a, a change of the mind. A change of the mind. Repent and be baptized, every one of you. That's not just for some. That's for every single person. The message of the gospel is not just for us here today, but for all those who will come after us. We, each and every one of us inside here, have to take the responsibility for teaching God's word to those who will one day be in the same position we are in today. A few years from now, a decade from now, a century from now, if Jesus don't come back yet, there will be people just like you sitting down, listening. We have the responsibility to teach God's word to those who will one day be in the same position we are in today. If we don't teach them, the world will teach them its own gospel and that is exactly what Satan wants. We see it out there. We have had people that have chosen to, to follow the world. And maybe that's because we didn't take responsibility enough to teach the true gospel of Jesus to them. If you're a parent today, you have the responsibility to teach your children the word of God. Don't expect the school to do it or somebody else to do it. You have the responsibility. Verses 42 to 47. It says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer, Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. Praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily, daily those who were being saved. That's also something to be excited about, daily. Not just like um, a few in a year, but daily. Every single day, people were being added to God's number. You know, I, I look at this and it's almost like a glimpse of heaven. The fact that we'll be surrounded by people of, from every um, race, creed, every nation. But we all have something in common. 
we serve the one true God. I think about my experience after my baptism. <laughs> the level of excitement and zeal that I felt. I remember going home afterwards and singing songs, probably waking up the neighbors next door, right? But I was excited to follow Jesus. There were no regrets. No regrets. You know, I just want to leave us with a few points and then we have a little section, a testimony section. Um, so we'll have two of our uh, a number sharing their testimony. I think it's it's really, really important that they do because in essence what Peter did here was share his testimony. He shared to the people the gospel of Jesus and he also shared how he came to Christ. I just want to leave us with some points here. Um if you guys could bring down a mic, we'll have um two people speak. Um God still changes lives. The same God that brought 3,000 people into his number when Peter spoke is the same God who could fill our church right now, 35 years we're celebrating, with thousands of people who are Holy Spirit filled and obedient to him. Thousands of people could fill here. I don't even think Cipriani has a thousand seats. Or don't worry, you can find a space with thousands of seats. Second point, God has given all of us who have chosen to repent and be baptized the forgiveness of sins and his gift of the Holy the, his gift, sorry, the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God is one of power. Let him work in you, and you will see miracles. The last point, God loves his church, and he wants us all to be unified. Despite our challenges, despite our disagreements, he intends for us to live, sorry, to love him first, but also love one another deeply. We're also called to love one another deeply. Love God, love people. Love your brothers and sisters in Christ, just as we see here in Acts 2. Praise God, enjoy the favor of all God's people, and see how he will bless not only our number, but also bless our hearts.